Welcome to the Asbury Project 2016. Can we get an applause for that? Woohoo! All right. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the provost of Asbury Seminary. Um, he's been here for five years and has seen some significant change, and he's been very instrumental in that. Um, he also, though, is an avid tennis player and an avid singer. So if we give him enough welcome, he may break out in a song. We never, and he's about to leave now. <laughs> but can you welcome uh, our provost, Doug Matthews, as he comes to introduce this project? Uh, what a pleasure to be with you. I'm so excited about what you're doing, the, the great attendance that you're having. I think it's pushing 250 or something like that. That's amazing, and I believe that's the largest. Just a few days ago, I was in the garage. We just moved this summer, and trying to start up my generator. And the generator was a Generac generator. And the battery was dead because in the midst of moving, we let it sit there and sit there and sit there. But I had a pull cord on it, and it started up, and heard like a kitten. It's just running fantastic. Well, I purchased that generator after a dry hurricane went through the state of Ohio because I was working up in Ohio. Now, if you don't believe that dry hurricanes exist, go to the inerrant inspired Wikipedia and it will uh, give you that information or Encyclopedia Britannica. But we had over $1.1 billion in damage in Ohio because of the 75 Cat 1 hurricane force winds that came through the state of Ohio without rain. And after that, uh, we had a lot of power outages anyhow. My wife said, we are buying a generator. No discussion, no negotiation. So we bought the Generac generator. Well, little did I know that my first task when I came to Asbury Theological Seminary was to address the question, do we want to interface with the Kern Foundation? Mr. Kern was the head of Generac Generators and their seminary initiative. And Mr. Kern was an entrepreneur, and because he apparently uh, manufactured just a ton of generators because he thought there would be a crisis someday, and then sold them, he had a lot of revenue. Well, that revenue is now in Jay Moon's pocket. <laughs> just kidding. But it's with Asbury Theological Seminary. And so that entrepreneurial spirit that can make a difference in the world, that can make a change in the world, um, is, kind of, is in my garage. I do have to buy a battery, but it's in my garage. So it's kind of ironic or providential or whatever you want to call it that they asked me to come and talk just a little bit about the background. So I was extremely pumped, extremely excited with addressing the question of engagement with Kern. Because Kern is beyond a specific denomination. It does, however, focus on how you can be entrepreneurial and make creative change and go beyond charity, which is a great thing, to systemic change. That's the background of that. And so when I was tasked with the initial relationship with Kern and I went up to Wisconsin and met with some of the leaders of Kern to talk about whether we could be involved in their seminary initiative, I immediately was in sync with Greg Forster, who was the individual who was leading the seminary initiative. And we got talking philosophy. <laughs> and we got talking Michael Novak and all these different people. And uh, we immediately realized that this was probably going to be a very exciting... My role was DNA. I didn't do the hard work. I did the DNA test. You know, Zazbury got the DNA that syncs up with Kern. And so we got talking about uh, political philosophy and Michael Novak. Kern sponsors the Acton Institute Conference since they have a Michael Novak Award probably rather relevant because Michael Novak was a revolutionary in the 1960s. He was a radical socialist. He was involved with the Democratic National Convention protests. Okay, we had protests, you know, last night. He was involved with these protests. And after a season, he finally shifted a bit and he realized that perhaps, and you can find this in his book, The Spirit of Democratic Capitalism, perhaps you can harness the creativity and the entrepreneurial spirit within the free enterprise framework in order to engage in systemic change, creative change, social amelioration or social amelioration. And so that was very exciting to me. But then I handed the baton to Dr. James Thobabin because he was over ethics. He did the next phase of the relationship with Kern. And then that was handed to Dr. Tom Tumblin who did the next phase of the 
of the relationship with Kern, and then that baton was handed to Jay Moon. So I think we're fourth year OFWE, third year with the, the Asbury Project or the TAP, uh, which is before us uh, today. But I am so thrilled that this event has grown and that you are exploring all the different ways that we can creatively advance the kingdom of God and values within the, uh, within the culture and within society. And I want to leave you with just a few quotes to stimulate your thinking from uh, Michael Novak. I don't think he's being judgmental here. He's not sitting on the eschatological white throne here. <laughs> but he made this statement. He said, not all of those who cry, help the poor, help the poor, will enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, he really believed that you had to have the right motive and you needed to be shrewd about how you do that. And I think you're exploring what's the shrewd way to do this. I looked at the, the tap on the web and you've got all these different businesses in Kentucky and all these different businesses in Orlando uh, that are finding different ways to do that from clothing to carpentry. I mean, it was really exciting what's, what's going on there. And I think that's the idea that you want to get beyond charity, you want to get beyond dependency, and you want to find creative ways to really make a difference in the world that we're living in. Another thing he said, but I think very relevant, he said, love is not a feeling of happiness, or at least not exclusively. Love is a willingness to sacrifice. And hence, what can we do? Many of these organizations are sacrificially serving their community, from what I understand. Another quote from Novak is uh, to know oneself, this is not Socrates, but uh, to know oneself is to disbelieve in utopia. And again, that means you're living in an environment with a free market. How can you lead such that you make a difference in people's lives? And so the initiative with Kern, the big vision, was to train pastors and Christian leaders to train their people who spent most of their time, their waking time, doing what? working, engaging with the economy, and harnessing that for the kingdom of God. Praise the Lord that you're doing that, and my prayers and blessings are with you during this great conference. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. I know you have a busy schedule, but sure appreciate you carving out time for this. So what I hope happens is during these next few days, you start to consider questions like this. How can you live out your missional calling in the marketplace? Not in spite of it, but through it. Or ask questions like this. Can you create businesses that create social change to reveal the kingdom of God in the way that God intended? Or questions like this. What gifts has God given to me that, like talents, I can reproduce to reveal the kingdom? So I hope that some of these kind of questions just percolate through your, your mind and your heart as we go about today. Because um, this is really the, the vision behind Mr. Kern, as Doug described, um, who is the grantor of this program. And he basically realized this. Um, he was a faithful attender of church. He had a, like a multi-billion dollar industry. But nobody in the church came to him for advice except during Stewardship Sunday when they asked him to write a check. So the implication is, the only redeeming thing about work is that you get to write checks to fund things that are useful. And Mr. Kern said, well, you know, don't I have some ability in um, managing resources, uh, strategic planning, and uh, mobilizing people, et cetera? They never asked me to, to address those questions. So perhaps the best way to change that scenario is to go to seminaries, and as people are going through this process of becoming pastors, becoming ministers, uh, church leaders, that they learn the intrinsic value of work, not just for its pragmatic uh, effect of creating bread on the table, but also it gives you a very venue to demonstrate your love of God and neighbor through that process, through being a part of the marketplace. Now, um, we think it's working because last year we've had uh, some more uh, participants who pitched their Asbury project, and those businesses are still ongoing. We actually have nine businesses in the last two years that have been incubated and are still up and running. So right now I'm gonna ask uh, three people to come forward who have started some businesses from last year. I think these two gentlemen and Colton is up here, yep. And then if Dr. Gill could join me as well. We're gonna ask them a few questions to kind of start off our time. Can we clap for these gentlemen here? Okay, why don't you just introduce yourself real quick, 
and the, uh, the project that you started last year. I, I'm uh, Colton Carey. I was part of a group comprised of uh, myself, Julie Spaulding, and Jesse Peterson. And the name of our uh, project last year was Running Social, which was a uh, fitness app for the better. Hey, I'm William O'Neill. Uh, Josh Moon and I started the Carpenter Shop last year, which builds custom furniture and with the idea of social change, mentoring college students uh, on how to live out their faith before they go into the workplace. And, uh, and we've been doing really well. Yeah, um, like you said, I'm Josh Moon, and uh, we co-founded The Carpenter Shop, and uh, it's been a blessing working with William and um, getting to work alongside him and uh, developing new skills, and, and uh, it's been great. All right, so we have some potential people who are going to launch their projects this year. What would you all recommend to them, either in their pitch tomorrow or um, what things, big things you've learned that would encourage them? Um, first off, practice. <laughs> That's definitely, uh, you know, a good thing to have. Um, and then, um, actually, I would say just value the moment of it before the actual pitch. I know it can be really nerve-wracking at times, and you want to go off to your own little corner and practice, but um, just really take, uh, take advantage of this moment right now and, um, you know, look around you and see what other people are doing and talk to other individuals and uh, really network. Um, I think that's a huge part of social entrepreneurship is um, not only creating a business that provides value for others, but just getting to see what other businesses are out there. And I think that's a very valuable thing, so. And, and also, you know, starting off with, with prayer of why, why you're doing this business, what's your passion behind it, and let that navigate how you present uh, your project and then also because Josh and I worked in a group, we were able to collaborate with one another, bounce off each other, uh, watch each other practice and help each other navigate, you know, things that they can work out and, and really uh, understand what we wanted to do for our business. And then also be, the way this is set up, you have a great opportunity to work with uh, mentors. So Josh was working with some of his professors over at the university. Dr. Moon was able to kind of help guide us along and so take advantage of, these, of, of the mentors and learn from them what you can. Yeah, I definitely agree with what both you guys said. Um, I think last year the, the main thing that I learned was that sometimes our greatest accomplishments can come out of our biggest challenges. Um, it was a really big challenge for me to have to um, give a presentation in the um, Pecha Kucha style. Um, I'm sure that's kind of an understatement, I guess. Um, but because of having that experience last year, I definitely feel more comfortable in giving a more um, professional presentation. And so hopefully all the practice that you guys put through um, this year will be worth it um, as you go on after this. At the end of the event, we're going to invest $10,000 in the ideas that are presented this year. We made that investment in your projects last year. So give us an update on what's happened in the last year. Where's the carpenter shop and where is Go Run For It today? Yeah, um, so the name of the project when we presented it at Asbury Project last year um, was Running Social. Um, it's gone through some kind of um, branding changes. Go Run For It now is what it's called. Um, after the project last year, um, Julie and I kind of passed the reins off to Jesse. Um, Jesse Peterson was kind of the man with the vision, man with the plan uh, behind the project last year. And he went on um, this past spring to present um, his idea, his business plan at um, Idea State. He had some success there. Um, and I believe he's now gearing up to um, officially release the app. So hopefully you guys can look forward to seeing that. So with the winnings from the project, Josh and I were able to buy the tools necessary to, to build, you know, high quality custom furniture and to, to move on uh, with our project. And uh, s since the, the winnings, our, our business has actually grown quite well and we've gotten high demands and, and the uniqueness of our business building custom furniture, we can build um, cheaper furniture uh, but still high quality to more expensive uh, woods made out of oak and we can make it uh, custom fit to any area, the style, the color, everything um, people want. So our niche has actually really worked and also using social media, we've been able to uh, 
get it out there to even the point we're actually making some shipments. And then Josh and I, as we've worked together, Josh's knowledge of carpentry has grown to the point where he's, uh, and I'm going to let him talk about that, uh, start his own uh, business through it um, on his own. Yeah, so um, a part of the carpentry shop was like intentional discipleship and, and mentorship. And, um, you know, that aspect for me uh, was, uh, you know, a great valuable thing for me. I got to work alongside William before, you know, working with carpentry. I really didn't know anything about that. Um, didn't know how to, you know, do anything really. But uh, William has come alongside me and um, we've made uh, pieces together and I've learned much about uh, all about this woodworking. And um, now I'm working on um, my own little, you know, endeavors. I've been working with some people with, from the seminary, uh, taking on smaller time, uh, small jobs there to uh, just kind of, you know, increase my uh, talent of carpentry, and I made a NT, uh, M piece for another customer, and so that was uh, that was great. But um, yeah, it's been good, and I've learned a lot through the whole entire process. I have another uh, 27 questions I wrote down that I want to ask you guys, but we're going to stay on track. So at this time, uh, give these guys a round of applause. And we're all gonna step off the stage and my colleague, Dr. Kevin Brown, has a, a few concluding comments and thoughts for us. Thank you. Okay, welcome. Hey, before uh, Dr. Gill actually comes back up and then provides instructions on what we're going to do next, what I hope that you recognize, not just in what you've heard here, what you heard from Dr. Moon, from the provost, uh, from my colleague, Mark, uh, but also throughout this entire two-day conference, is that there are really three streams that are of great interest to us and that have really motivated and animated this entire event. First and foremost is entrepreneurship, that we believe that the creative process, the business mechanism, can be harnessed in a way to achieve valuable ends. And that leads to the second thing, social impact. This is not simply about making money, it's about influencing a kind of environment that we believe models the kingdom of God. And so this is more than just simply, uh, again, uh, producing a profit or having a business, but it has in mind an end that is multifaceted and includes something that links up to our third area, and that is faith. Uh, what we're doing here this weekend, this conference, the Office of Faith, Work, and Economics, uh, this is not in spite of our faith. This is a direct function of our faith. You know, I've been exposed to a lot of different uh, environments that look at business within a Christian context. And let me say, and I don't mean this in a negative way, uh, but what you'll find with many of them is simply superimposing Christianity onto an otherwise regular business paradigm. And I, I don't want to say that there's anything wrong with that, but I think that there's a much richer narrative that we can offer as people of faith, that our faith and what we do is uh, in business is a function of what we believe. We believe that we bear God's image, that we are God-reflecting individuals. And what are some of the things we know about our Creator? We know that He is creative. We know He's productive. We know that He's relational. And either, these are all things that get mobilized into the marketplace. This is primarily what we're doing. And if God is creative and productive and relational, and I bear his image, are there implications for me in my commercial activity? You bet. <laughs> so those are the things that we want you to pay attention to this week. We hope that they are very evident. And these are the things that we've taken seriously over the last couple of years and absolutely go into the planning of events like this. So before we have instructions on what to do ne next, uh, I would just simply ask that you join me in prayer. Lord, as mentioned, we don't want to superimpose Christianity onto what is a part of your nature and our nature, activity, Lord. And not just activity for the sake of activity, but Lord, faithful activity. We want to be found faithful unto you. We want our work and our productivity and our relationships with others, our creative thinking. God, we want these things ultimately to be glorifying unto you, to let our light so shine, not so that we can be glorified, Lord, but ultimately so that it may glorify you. 
and show other people the kingdom of God. Please join us, Lord. Uh, we invite you into these spaces. I pray, Father, that we would ultimately be stimulated and motivated uh, by what you're doing in our lives and that you would carry this through into the future so that we could look back and say, look how God was with us. Look at the exciting things that have happened and are continuing to happen. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the men and women in this room. We pray that you be among us. Ask all these things in Christ Jesus' holy name. So as Dr. Brown mentioned, we have a creative God. And throughout the weekend, or throughout the next two days, we'll have the opportunity to be exposed to creativity in a lot of different ways. Uh, tomorrow at 2.30, we will have our business plan competition. It will take place right here on this stage, where 10 teams will be presenting their ideas. Um, the presentations go quickly. Their slides appear only for 20 seconds. They only get 20 of them. Every six minutes and 40 seconds, one team will walk off and a new one will walk on. After that, though, we've added a new twist to this year's event, which is creativity in the space of art. And so after we finish the pitch competition, you're invited over to the banquet dinner at the university's cafeteria. And upstairs in the cafeteria, there's an art gallery where the artists have collaborated with winners from the first year of the Asbury Project and created unique art pieces, their interpretation of the creativity of the entrepreneur. Uh, and our uh, curator of the art exhibit, uh, Professor Keith Barker, will be giving a brief talk before uh, there is a reception at that exhibit. So you have multiple opportunities to interact, to, to interact with the creativity of your fellow students. Um, our chapel, as you can see, is not completely full. So my challenge to you is bring friends. Bring people you just met. Bring random people walking down the street. We want to completely fill this room with people that will be exposed to God's creativity as exhibited through our presenters tomorrow. And we have two speakers that we've brought in to be a part of the Asbury Project, Dwight Gibson and Chris Horst. They will be presenting this afternoon. As we head out of here into the lobby, there will be students to help direct you to either Beeson 157, if your last name begins with A through M, or if your last name begins with N through Z, the Alan Richard Chapel. So as you go out, half of y'all go here, Chris, the other half will go here, Dwight. Fifty minutes later, we'll switch places and then you get to hear the other half. So we have two presentations before tonight's banquet dinner. And uh, at this point, we're right on schedule. So I'll release you, head out the back doors of the chapel and our students will be there to guide you to either 157 for A through M or the Richard Allen Chapel for N3Z. Thank you, and welcome to the Asbury Project.